Well, Blessed Tuesday to you as we come with your daily encouragement, and we are at Revelation 14. We've already gone through a couple verses, actually three verses, and we're still in the middle of verse 3 here. So one could say this is uh, 3b, or, you know, we divide the verses between a and b, so the, the second part of the verse, verse 3. And we're talking about the song before the throne, the, the song before um, the Lamb who is standing on Mount Zion. We don't know if that's a human standing or a, a four-legged standing since he's the Lamb. 144,000 represent the believers. And they are singing a new song because the voice from heaven has given them a new song. We're not yet revealed the content of the new song, but we are revealed to the quality. It's like many waters. It's like harpists. It's, it's divine. It's something that is outside of ourselves. And so it says, no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who have been redeemed from the earth. So it is a song that is sealed for present time. Now, I know in our liturgy, as we celebrate in our Lutheran church, and many uh, would say even in the Catholic, Episcopal, and others that have more traditional liturgy, this is the moment where we imitate it in many ways, like the hymn of praise. The hymn of praise is typically two things. It is typically the songs of the angels before the shepherds at Christmas, or it is the hosts that are worshiping in the book of Revelation. Remember, the Rev book of Revelation is also about more than Bible prophecy. It is about worship, worship in heaven as in on earth. And so that is where we get kind of that injunction to be imitative of what is going on in heaven. And it is interesting, even in the most contemporary of worship services, many of them will always talk about praise hymns. And usually they personify the angels and or the worshiping before the throne in the book of Revelation. Now, some maybe kind of go a little far afield. We all do. I'm not trying to cast dispersions on just a few people, but we all kind of stray from that. We we want to talk about life, and, and it's okay to have hymns of life, of, you know, things like I think of Amazing Grace, where the the message of heaven hits earth who saved a wretch like me but man, many of our hymns are very upward focus are very lamb focus are very jesus focus if they are to be true christian hymns so that's something to just kind of consider in your worship time i say that the two things to consider are is it focused on jesus or is it focused on situations here on earth that's one of the things that we get in trouble with during Christmas time. There's many Christmas songs, obviously, that focus on the birth of Jesus and are focused on the characters of the birth of Jesus, Mary and Joseph and the Lamb. But there also are plenty of other Christmas songs, and, and technically they're called secular Christmas because they focus on secular things, earthly things. How beautiful the tree looks. How lovely are the the drinks that we are enjoying and the meal that we are having or the desire to be not in heaven, but to be home with the family during Christmas time. There's nothing wrong with any of the hymns except in a worship context. Are they focused on Jesus, the lamb who was slain or the birth of Jesus? Or are they focused on the secular things going on at the time. And that's where in Christmas time, we kind of get those kind of mixed up. In the book of Revelation, it is squarely upon the things that are happening in heaven. In many ways, why? Because the things on earth are in total destruction. There's not something to be celebrating. We're not dancing around the Christmas tree. We're not uh, enjoying the fellowship of people here. You know, I mean, it's it is so squarely saying it's like my my hope is in heaven and in nowhere else, and that's part of the reason why it is focused on that. But it is something that we need to consider when we worship. Also, that we worship not so much with the word "I." I mean, there's beautiful "I" hymns like uh, "Amazing Grace," who's uh, who whose grace saved a, a wretch like me. I mean, very I focused. But many of our hymns need to be we-focused. 
And in our two creeds, we have the very I-centered Apostles' Creed, and we have the very we-centered Nicene Creed. Both are important for worship, too. And I'd say more so the we is important at worship because... I can sing a praise song by myself. I can sing the praise song in the privacy of my uh, headphones or voice. But when we get together for church, we need to be about the we, the body of Christ. We're gathering together. And you have brothers and sisters now who are standing side by side. And I know no matter how I focused your private worship may be, you should not neglect the we focused. And especially if we are at big gatherings. There's a lot of we-focused and those gatherings, too. So let us remember those things today, too. And it says, No one could learn the saying except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. We don't know its content yet, but we are described it's what's going on. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. They follow the Lamb wherever he goes. Now, let's let's look at the elephant in the room. For many of us as believers, we are maybe in a married state or we are um, not in a virgin state. Um, so we might have to ask that question, you know, is this a specific group of people or is it all believers? And to some extent, our souls have always been forgiven, are brought back to square one. And there's nothing wrong with being in a marital state and being a believer. But according to this, it means that we're brought back to uh, an original purity where we have not uh, engaged in the things of this earth. Once again, in heaven, there's no need to have sexual or marital relations. We know that from scripture. In heaven, we are in a purified state where we have a unity that is different from the unity that we have in things on earth. So we might have to ask that question, you know, how do I how do I get into that state again? Well, you do it through forgiveness. You do it through the the filling of the Holy Spirit. So I don't think that this is necessarily 144,000 only virgins. Otherwise, we'd all have to be monks or become shakers or something like that. But that's something that we might need to wrestle with. Exactly. Is this a distinct group of people or is it all believers? And, and that's a debate that happens with the interpretation here. But I think that we shouldn't let that word alone um impede uh, on the possibility that it is all believers who have been redeemed, who have been brought forth. And so that might be asking the timeline. Is it based on what you have done on earth, or is it based on our future hope as being saints in heaven? And I think either way, in the blood of the Lamb, we have our sins forgiven, and we have been reborn new creations, children of God, as Paul says. But yet we still struggle with the old creation and the things of the old creation. In church each week, we have new things happening as much as we have old things through old things happening. So we need to always ask ourselves, are we in both at the same time or are we moving into a new thing? I'm going to stop right there, and we'll we'll continue the rest tomorrow. But God bless you today. We trust that these continue to be words of encouragement as we worship together the Lamb in our Mount Zions of the world. Take care.